A hard journey, a stay in jail, a reunion, and dead babies in a tree. All in this episode of What the F Does This Mean, Blood Meridian. Welcome to What the F Does This Even Mean, Blood Meridian. I'm your host, Amy, from Amy Gets Lit. This is the third episode in my series on Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. In the last video, I talked about chapters 2, 3, and 4. This video will be covering four chapters, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Just to recap, in the last video, the kid met a hermit who gave him shelter along with some thoughts on life, herders that offered him kindness and a job, and a bartender the kid kills when he wouldn't give him a drink. We joined Captain White's filibuster traveling to Mexico. As they traveled, the terrain and environment became more brutal than the day before. The filibuster comes across a group of herders, but Captain White didn't think they presented too much of a threat. The real threat came when they realized they were surrounded by hundreds of Comanches on horseback. A battle ensued. We end the chapter with the men from the filibuster line scalped and dying with their horses staggering and screaming. Did anyone survive? And now the journey continues with chapter five. I think that chapter five is a very significant chapter to the story because I think things are different now. What we've had so far is the before. This is now the after. With darkness, one soul rose wondrously from among the new slain dead and stole away in the moonlight. The ground where he'd lain was soaked with blood and urine from the voided bladders of the animals and he went forth stained and stinking like some reeking issue of the incarnate dam of war herself. The kid lives! We don't find out how he survived, given his inexperience and the sheer number of adversaries they were facing, but the use of the word wondrously here implies to me that he survived by some sheer luck, good or bad you be the judge, or some sort of fate. The kid walks through the desert in its darkness. He can still hear the Comanches at their camp and even after walking all night he could still see their fires burning behind him. I think the inclusion of this is really important here. I think it demonstrates just how alone he is. The kid has sort of always been alone, but it was in environments he could have some sort of control over or at least feel like he could. As he travels forth, we see just how much he is at the mercy of the environment he's in. As day breaks, he begins climbing rocks and hears someone shout out to him. He meets a man named Sproul. Sproul tells him that he and eight others were able to escape, including Captain White. Sproul was injured badly in his run with the Comanches and holds his arm. They find a cave to sleep in for the night. The next day, they take to the plane again. From the book. They followed the trampled ground left by the war party and in the afternoon they came upon a mule that had failed and been lanced and left dead and then they came upon another. The way narrowed through rocks and by and by they came to a bush that was hung with dead babies. They stopped side by side, reeling in the heat. These small victims, seven, eight of them, had holes punched in their under jaws and were hung so by their throats from the broken stobs of a mesquite to stare eyeless at the naked sky. Bald and pale and bloated, larval to some unreckonable being, the castaways hobbled past. They looked back. Nothing moved. In the afternoon, they came upon a village on the plain where smoke still rose from the ruins and all were gone to death. From a distance, it looked like a decaying brick kiln. They stood without the walls a long time listening to the silence before they entered. They went slowly through the little mud streets. There were goats and sheep slain in their pens and pigs dead in the mud. They passed mud hovels where people lay murdered in all attitudes of death in the doorways and the floors, naked and swollen and strange. They found plates of food half eaten and a cat came out and sat in the sun and watched them without interest and flies snarled everywhere in the still hot air. At the end of the street, they came to a plaza with benches and trees where vultures huddled in foul black rookeries. A dead horse lay in the square and some chickens were pecking in a patch of spilled meat in a doorway. Charred poles lay smoldering where the roofs had fallen through and a burrow was standing in the open door of the church. This passage gives us a lot of information and there are a few things that we need to talk about here. I think primarily, it doesn't matter if it's animal or man or woman or child, death does not care. Neither do the death bringers. This is definitely a theme that we'll see repeated throughout this novel. The image of the children in the bush. This is haunting, and it's one of the images most people remember from this book. So why did they do this? Why did they stage these dead babies that way? 
Perhaps it was a warning. We don't care about you. We don't care about your children. We will kill you all. Perhaps it was a way to stop the next generation that could war with them from coming to be. We may be able to look at this with a disconnection because the novel takes place in the 1850s mostly. And we know the world was a violent time then, especially in the Northwest. There is modern day examples similar to this. Um, in the Cambodian killing fields, they had a tree. It was called the Chankiri tree. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. The children of those killed by the Khmer Rouge were then killed using a tree so that the children wouldn't grow up and take revenge for their parents' death. You see this happen in modern war too. Children lose their lives. It may not be staged in such a way, but the end result's the same. Whether it's knives and Apaches in the 1850s or drones and bombs in contemporary times. In contemporary times though, we call it collateral damage. War doesn't care. I also think that this is a statement of death of innocence for the kid. It serves as a warning to the reader too. What you're about to encounter going forth is brutal and violent. Be prepared. And while the images of the tree may horrify and shock us, they don't horrify and shock Sproul and the kid. They simply look back as they move into the village. When they get to the village, they find much of the same, death and destruction everywhere. Sprawl, with his cut and infected arm, confides in the kid that he has consumption and came to Mexico for his health. The kid decides to venture throughout the town to find food. While he does find food, he also finds more death. Again from the book. The doorways were low and he had to stoop to clear the lintel beams, stepping down into the cool and earthy rooms. There was no furniture save pallets for sleeping, perhaps a wooden meal bin. He went from house to house. In one room, the bones of a small loom black and smoldering. In another, a man, the charred flesh drawn taut, the eyes cooked in their sockets. There was a niche in the mud wall with figures of saints dressed in dolls' clothes, the rude wooden faces brightly painted. Illustrations cut from an old journal and pasted to the wall, a small picture of a queen, a gypsy card that was the Four of Cups. There were strings of dried peppers and a few gourds. When the kid returns to the square, Sproul is gone. He finds him in the church, along with the scalped and naked and partly eaten bodies of some 40 souls who have barricaded themselves in the house of God against the heathen. They come across a gruesome scene where the villagers sought safety in the church to only die terrible deaths there. They head back to the square, attempting to shoo away buzzards that continue to feast on the dead. The next day, they leave the village and continue their travels in the same difficult terrain and brutal heat they've been traveling so far. They sleep when they can. They trudge forward, finding an abandoned wagon to camp under. They sleep all afternoon into the evening. When they wake up, they carry on. Sproul says his arm is beginning to stink. The kid offers to look at it, but Sproul refuses. There isn't anything that the kid would be able to do about his arm. I think this is here to show that the kid realizes that they're all each other's have right now. Sproul is also what's keeping him from being alone. They travel all day and night and see a lake and a white city in the distance before they collapse from heat, dehydration, and exhaustion, and they sleep. When they wake up the next day, Sproul's health has taken a turn for the worst. He is collapsing, his mouth is blistered, and fluid is seeping out of his foul-smelling arm. The kid notices people in the distance. They realize that the lake and city they saw the day before were hallucinations that they were both sharing. I'm not sure how that works. The kid spits and a lizard quickly comes and drinks his saliva while they're thirsty. The group approaches and ride on by. The kid calls out to them, hey, yo, what's up? Wait for us. The leader of this Mexican party of seven or eight is on top of Captain White's horse. So where's Captain White? They ask if Sproul and the kid are out hunting the Comanche. When the Comanches are mentioned, the rest of the Mexican party dismount from their horses. They embrace and they mourn. They offer the kid and Sproul water from their canteen. The kid will not stop drinking. The leader knocks the canteen out of the kid's hand and Sproul grabs it and he starts drinking. The kid climbs over and grabs it away from Sproul and starts drinking again until the leader pulls a sword on him. The scene shows how dehydrated and desperate both the kid and Sproul have become. I think it also demonstrates how weak Sproul has become. I have a hard time believing that if Sproul were in good health, he would have let the kid get away with that. The leader tells the kid that when lambs cry, sometimes it's the mother who answers and sometimes it's the wolf and he's off again. Sproul and the kid continue their journey. That night, Sproul is attacked by a vampire black bat that sucks his blood. The vultures, the buzzards, the worms, the vampire bat, in nature, they, the humans, are the ones being fed upon. 
I think these details are really interesting statements on how animals can adapt and survive in environments that humans can't, despite the idea that humans are superior to animals. The next morning, Sproul's arm is now the size of a thigh with worms eating off his flesh. Ugh. That afternoon, they come to a crossroads. They decide to take the path that looks the most traveled and come across a wagon carrying a family. They force themselves on, drink all their water, and travel with the family to their home. They sleep in the wagon that night. When the kid wakes up the next morning, Sproul's dead. While outside the wagon wean, the kid is arrested by Mexican soldiers and led through town. The kid is stood in front of a jar with a floating head of Captain White. He denies knowing him. He is then thrown in jail with three other men from Captain White's filibuster. The kid burrows down with one of the men from the filibuster who's from Georgia. They exchange stories about what they've both been through. The kid calls Captain White a fool. He learns from the kid from Georgia that Captain White's body was eaten by pigs. Have you ever all been on a farm? Do you know what pigs do after they eat? And do you know what farmers use that waste for? I think it's funny that Captain White literally becomes fertilizer for the land that he was determined to take. It's small things like this to me, despite that they're violent, that are sort of humorous too. Like, he ultimately got what was coming for him, doesn't he? The prisoners are loaded up and taken to Chihuahua City where they are once again paraded through the streets before being taken to another prison. From the book. When their eyes lost their blindness, they could make out figures crouched along the wall. Stirrings in beds of hay like nesting mice disturbed. A light snoring. Outside the rattle of a cart and the dull clump of hoofs in the street and through the stones a dim clank of hammers from a smith shop in another part of the dungeon. The kid looked about. Blackened bits of candle wick lay here and there in pools of dirty grease on the stone floor and strings of dried spittle hung from the walls. A few names scratched where the light could find them out. He squatted and rubbed his eyes. Someone in underwear crossed before him to a pail in the center of the room and stood and pissed. This man then turned and came his way. He was tall and wore his hair to his shoulders. He shuffled through the straw and stood looking down at him. You don't know me, do ye? He said. The kid spat and squinted up at him. I know ye, he said. I know you're hide in a tan yard. How do you like city life? Said Toadvine. I don't like it worth a damn so far. The kid is reunited with our friend and his partner in crime, Toadvine, in prison. Before they go out into the street to work, Toadvine tells the kid that they'll get out of jail. That night, the kid sleeps between Toadvine and a veteran of the Mexican-American War from Kentucky. We find out this man's name is Granny Rat. Granny Rat came back to Mexico for the woman he loved and he was arrested. He shares stories about the Mexican-American War and the kid tells them both about what happened to the filibuster. While they're out working the next day, the three watch as a group of half-drunk men ride into town on Indian ponies. They were wearing animal skins and some had their hair decorated with human teeth or accessorized their outfits with the necklaces made of blackened human ears. They had weapons of all kinds. One of the men, however, stood out to them. From the book. Foremost among them, outsized and childlike with his naked face, rode the judge. His cheeks were ruddy and he was smiling and bowing to the ladies and doffing his filthy hat. The enormous dome of his head when he bared it was blinding white and perfectly circumscribed about so that it looked to have been painted. He and the reeking horde of rabble with him passed on through the stunned streets and hove up before the governor's palace where their leader, a small black-haired man, clapped for entrance by kicking at the oaken doors with his boot. The doors were opened forthwith and they rode in, rode in all, and the doors were closed again. Gentlemen, said Toadvine, I guarantee goddamn tea ye I know what that there is about. The following day, the judge and the company of others stood in the street smoking a cigar and rocking back on his heels. He wore a pair of good kidskin boots and he was studying the prisoners where they knelt in the gutter, clutching up the filth with their bare hands. The kid was watching the judge. When the judge's eyes fell upon him, he took his cigar from between his teeth and smiled. Or he seemed to smile. Then he put the cigar between his teeth again. That night, Tovine called them together, and they crouched by the wall and spoke in whispers. His name is Glanton, said Tovine. He's got a contract with Trias. They're to pay him $100 a head for scalps and 1000 for Gomez's head. I told him there was three of us. Gentlemen, we're getting out of this shithole. Toadvine kept his promise to the kid. Three days later, they got out of jail and rode in a single file line out of town. 
Chapter 7 starts out by telling us about the two John Jacksons. One is white and one is black. White John Jackson antagonizes black John Jackson as they ride, using black John Jackson's shadow as his shade from the sun and whispering to him. Black John Jackson checks him. The gang watched the two, seeing where the tension's going to go between them, but none of them get involved. I think Cormac McCarthy opens up chapter seven, introducing us to the two John Jacksons to show us how race is the only thing that separates most of these men in Glanton's gang. Their natures, their ability to be violent, their characters are all the same. I think this is supported further in the chapter when we learn about the Delaware tribe members that are part of Glanton's gang. We meet Bathcat, who is originally from Wales, Tobin, the former priest, and McGill, the single Mexican member of the gang. Membership to this gang is about financial opportunity and is not built around any moral or racial construction. Then the story switches to something that had happened earlier in the morning. They meet up with a man named Spire who has a crate of four dozen guns from the Baton Rouge arsenal to sell to Glanton. Glanton takes one out of the crate, loads it, shoots birds, vases, a goat in the courtyard, because why not? Spire and Glanton argue over the price of the guns when the commotion attracts the attention of a group of Mexican soldiers and they want to know what's going on. Spire and Glanton tell them all's cool, but Aguilar, the Mexican sergeant, doesn't believe them. This is when Silver Tongue Judge Holden steps in and talks to Aguilar to smooth things over, eventually showing him how the guns work and passing money in his hand. The gang is off the next day, each with a couple of pistols in their possession as they travel on. A couple of days into riding, a man approaches Toadvine and asks if he wants to wager who kills who, Black John Jackson or White John Jackson. Tovine has no interest in embedding, especially with a man wearing a necklace of human ears. He learns that, like him, this man called Bathcat is also a former fugitive. They travel forward to the town of Corlito. While the ragtag group sets up camp in the town plaza for the night, Glanton, Judge Holden, and brothers David and Charlie Brown go dine at the estate of a Mexican general. This is the second time a government official has met with Glanton. I think the inclusion of this to the story is meant to demonstrate further how Glanton has relationships with powerful officials within the Mexican government, and this whole scalping party is funded by the Mexican government. They are doing the Mexican government's bidding by dealing with the Apaches who, to this point, have been terrorizing and slaughtering Mexican villages in their path. As they're about to get the hell out of Dodge, they are approached by a family of magicians that ask to travel with them for safe passage to Hanos. The family doesn't speak English and Glanton doesn't speak Spanish. I wonder why Judge Holton doesn't intervene here. We know from his interaction with Aguilar that he speaks the language. After they pantomime to one another to communicate, Glanton says the family can accompany them, but they have to ride in the rear, and he's not promising them their safety. The travel continues until they camp one night, and Glanton asks the magician if he reads tarot. The magician produces a pack of cards. The John Jackson that is black picks a card. The magician's wife starts rocking back and forth and chanting in Spanish. John Jackson wants to know what she's saying and asks Tobin, the former priest, to tell him. Tobin refuses, saying that this is idolatry, and tells Jackson to ignore her. Jackson asks the judge what is happening. After Jackson had his card read, the judge looks at the kid and tells the magician to read the kid's future. The kid looked at the man and he looked at the company about. CC said the juggler, offering the cards. He took one. He had not seen such cards before, yet the one he held seemed familiar to him. He turned it upside down and regarded it, and he turned it back. The juggler took the boy's hand in his own and turned the card so he could see it. Then he took the card and he held it up. Cuadro de Copas, he called out. This isn't the first time the kid has seen the Four of Cups card. It's not the first time you and I have seen the Four of Cups card in this book. In Chapter 5, when he was in the village with Sproul and went searching for food, on the wall of one of the homes was the Four of Cups card. I'm not well versed in tarot, so please forgive my very simple Google assisted thoughts on what this could mean, but the card appearing in two chapters and two chapters so close together tells me there is absolutely significance to this. From what I could gather, the card depicts a boy unaware of the cups being offered to him because his focus is inward and not outward. I find this interesting because we get really zero internalization from the kid in this novel. It can also mean that one is apathetic or selfish. If you know about tarot, I would love for you to leave your thoughts on the appearance of this card twice and how it connects to the kid below, because this is a mystery I need solved, y'all. Now the judge instructs the juggler to read Glanton's future. It is interesting to note here that Judge Holton seems to be the one orchestrating and in control of the fortune reading around the fire. Glanton refused initially. Glanton pulled a card, but before the magician can even read it, it disappears. 
The woman starts getting very upset and has, says his card is the card of revenge and war. She talks about the evil win. Glanton gets upset with the Mexican woman and draws his revolver on her. She continues, hearse, full of bones, the boy that. The judge, like a great ponderous gin, stepped through the fire, and the flames delivered him up as if he were in some way native to their element. He put his arms around Glanton. So, my question here is this. Did the judge interrupt the woman so she couldn't finish her sentence about the boy? Was Glanton about to shoot, and did he save the woman's life? Could it be both? The next morning, they journey on and reach Hanos, where they meet up with the two Delawares that had ridden ahead of them. The Delawares have with them an old Apache woman they found at a meat camp. McGill, he said. A Mexican, solitary of his race in that company, came forward. Get that receipt for us. McGill then scalps the Apache woman. Bathcat, Toadvine, and the kid are sitting around and notice that a shirtless John Jackson leaves the magician's daughter's tent, and the chapter ends. Toadvine, Bathcat, and the kid decide to hit up the bar. Their interaction with the bartender is yet another example of them having difficulty communicating because of the language barrier. I think that McCarthy includes this so much to keep reminding us that Glanton and his gang, they're the foreigners here. They came here. The bar is nearly empty except for a group of men playing cards in a dark corner. An old man approaches them to talk. He asks if they're from Texas and says he's been there once. He asks if they're there to kill the Apaches. They hear a groan come from the back of the room. The conversation with the man continues asking how much they're being paid to kill the Apaches. Neither the kid, Toadvine, or Bathcat answer him. The old man goes on to tell them that if they kill Gomez, they will get paid a lot of money. He then goes on to talk about how much blood has been shed in Mexico and that it's a good country and that he prays for it. We find out that the moaning came from a man in the corner that was stabbed for cheating at the card game. The man is the son of the old man. Glanton's gang leaves the next day. The judge notices that Granny Cat is gone. What's become of Chambers, he said. I believe he's quit. Quit. I believe he has. Did he ride out this morning? Not with us, he never. It was my understanding that you spoke for your group. Toadvine spat. He appears to be of spoke for himself. When did you last see him? Seen him yesterday evening. But not this morning? Not this morning. The judge regarded him. Hell, said Tovine. I allowed you to know he was gone. It ain't like he was so small you never would miss him. The next day, two of the Delawares were gone. They travel on and camp for the night. Two fires were made. Around one sat all the white members of Glanton's gang. Around the second, all the others. The white Jackson is sitting around the fire, drunk and worse for wear. When Black Jackson goes to sit down around the fire, he sits with the white members of Glanton's gang. White Jackson tells him to leave and to go sit by the other fire. Until this point, we haven't really heard much about White Jackson since the opening of Chapter 7. Though Black Jackson has been mentioned throughout the story with Aguilar and then the fortune reading and with the magician's daughter. Black Jackson asked White Jackson if that was his last word on the matter and White Jackson says, yep, it is. Black Jackson goes to get up. Black Jackson returns with a bowie knife and beheads White Jackson. Glanton rose. The men moved away. No one spoke. When they set out in the dawn, the headless man was sitting like a murdered anchorite, decalced in ashes and sark. Someone had taken his gun, but the boots stood where he'd put them. The company rode on. They had not gone forth one hour upon that plain before they were ridden upon by the Apaches. And so ends chapter 8. I hope you've enjoyed this breakdown of chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. The next video will be chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. Are there any parts of this next part of our adventure that stick out to you? Let me know in the comment section down below and let's discuss things. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to hit subscribe and ring that bell. Last week, some people weren't getting notified when the new video was uploaded. Until next week, bye bye